It is true, I have been here almost a year. Believe it or not, I was hired at the Ohio Conference on April 1st. My friends at the office like to remind me that I was an April Fool's hire, and they've had a lot of fun with that. And here's what's actually kind of funny. When I went to Northern New England, I served as a pastor in the, in the Carolina Conference for 23 years before I started administrative work. And I went up to Northern New England, and I got hired up there on April 1st. So apparently it's, it's, it's a bit of a theme. If it happens again, I'm going to start to feel a little self-conscious about the whole thing. Uh, I have been blamed since I have been here for the hard winter that Ohio just had. I have been told that Ohio had a hard winter. And when I get blamed for that, I say, was it winter? Did, did we have winter? And then people just shut up and go away because, you, you know, what, what else are you going to say? So I, I just, I didn't think that it was a terribly hard winter. You know, up in Maine, we often, I, I think the coldest that we had at my house, I lived in southern Maine, the coldest we had at my place was about minus 20. The snow would often come all the way up on my deck, all the way to my deck rails. And so, like, you just looked out, you know, out of, the, out of the window there, and, like, your deck rails were gone. That was just all snow. And I had a 700-foot driveway. I blew it with a little John Deere um, little thing on the front. And I have to tell you, it was really, really fun when I took the call to Ohio to sell all of that snowblowing equipment and to not have to move that with me to Ohio. Hey, buddy, we got a live one here, huh? That's all right. No, don't be sorry. It's okay. Uh, so, again, I'm the new guy, Bob Cundiff. I've been here with you for about a year. I haven't gotten to travel very much. Uh, more and more churches are starting to open now in our COVID response, but it has not been a usual year. It hasn't been an ordinary year. And I'm at the place where I meet a lot of people. I meet people on Zoom meetings because I Zoom all the time. And then sometimes I'll meet people, and I think I know them because we've Zoomed so many times. And then they remind me that I don't actually know them uh, because we haven't actually met yet. But uh, a number of our pastors and teachers, I've only been on the campuses of, I think, one, two, three of our schools because our schools have not been allowing visitors to come in as a way of trying to control that environment and keep the infection down, which, is, which I think is very appropriate and very wise. But um, it's been an unusual year. I haven't gotten to travel as much as I want to. So uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I served as the president up in the Northern New England Conference for seven years. Um, and then I've been in Ohio for about a year now. So I'm about eight years removed from a regular pulpit. My move up to Northern New England was odd. I went from the pulpit to the president's chair in about six months. They brought me up as secretary. And I didn't know when I went up that the president was looking for his exit and looking to get out of there. So I had only been there about a month when he announced to me that he was tendering his resignation and he was heading off to retirement. And I said, oh, what does that mean? Because it's not like people knew me. So it was kind of interesting. I, I was secretary for about six months. Up there, we tease and say he wasn't very good at it, so we took that job away from him after a very brief period of time. Before that, I was pastoring in the Carolina Conference. I'm not a person who has moved around a lot, so I told the executive committee when they hired me here, I said, don't hire me unless you like me, because I, I'm hard to get rid of. I have a tendency to stay. Down in the Carolinas, in my 23-year tenure there, I only had one move in 19 years. I was in a pulpit for 10 years, and then at my next pulpit, I was there for nine years. And that's just, just kind of been the way that we've done our ministry. We seem to have experienced that people seem to appreciate longevity and not having someone that just comes and goes as, as quickly as they possibly can. I will tell you that being a pastor can be a bit of a bipolar experience. Sometimes it's really, really, really great. And sometimes it's terrible. I had one day where I did a wedding in the morning and a funeral in the afternoon. And to kind of get your head in that space and be able to celebrate the wedding and, and, and be on board and do that well, and then to come back and to, and to be involved in the funeral service and to minister to that family and be a part of that social environment was kind of it, was, was a challenge. Um, Sometimes you think, well, what are the difficult parts of being a pastor? Well, for, for the first, let's do the positive. What are the fun times of being a pastor? Well, it's when you lead a church through a time of growth and vision and enthusiasm and all the rest of that. Those are the fun times of being a pastor. That would be perfect. Thank you. Um, when you. When you do weddings, when you lead a couple through the premarital experience and premarital counseling and all the rest of that. I, I've had these moments where I've bonded with couples so that on the wedding day when I'm standing up there and, and the bride is here and the groom's here, it's like it's really just the three of us. We kind of forget that the whole church is out there watching because the three of us have bonded spiritually as we're working to create that new family and set that new family up on a solid footing. 
Um, when you lead a church through a time of growth and vision and when your baptismal tank is full on regular, on regular intervals, I remember one church I was pastoring, we were, we were in growth mode and things were going really, really well. And my head deacon came up to me one day and he, his face was red and he said, Pastor, people are parking on the lawn. And I smiled at him and I put my hand on his shoulder and I leaned in and I said, Scott, that's a good thing, right? And suddenly he realized what he had just said. And he was like, oh, oh yeah, 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 I know. It, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. A couple weeks later, he came to me. He says, Pastor, I know this is a good thing, but I just want you to know there's cigarette smoke in our men's room. And I said, Scott, it's a good thing. We'd rather that whoever it is was here rather than not here. But we're going to mentor people and disciple people and move people along but we're, we're, we're doing good work here. You know, those, those are good times. What are some of the difficult times? Well, it's, it's when you, it's when churches fight. And, and you just, you, you inevitably, you get sucked into that. It, it's when you realize that you have an unstoppable force that is headed toward an immovable object. And, and how do you respond to that? No matter what you do, you're going to tick off this group, that group, or both groups. And as the pastor, you get sucked into that. And that sometimes you get pulled between wondering who your boss is. Is your boss the matriarch of the church or the patriarch of the church? Or is your boss the church board? Or is your boss the school board? Or is your boss the whole congregation? Or is your boss your conference president? Or is it your ministerial secretary? Or is it your wife? All right? It's the last one. There's a wise man there. You, you, get, you get sucked into all that. And sometimes it's just really a challenge, just knowing what is going to be the best and the most appropriate way to respond to that. Or it's when the phone rings in the middle of the night. And your first thought as you leave dream world and come back to the temporal world is this is not good. And it's not. It's not good. You answer the phone, and it's that terrible, terrible phone call of the accident and there's this young life that is just full of energy and life and enthusiasm and joy and it gets snuffed out by some driver's ridiculous careless actions and of course the drunk always walks away without a scratch right and they kill the 17 year old young lady from your congregation oh those are those are terrible moments Right? And you're standing in the hospital in the middle of the night around the bed as they're talking about withdrawing life support. And at some point, mom or dad looks at you and with this, coming from this deep place of hurt and confusion, they say, where's your God now? Where's God now? This is what I get. I've tried to live my life for him. I've tried to honor him. I've done everything that I thought I was supposed to do. I've been a faithful attender and, 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 and tither and, and servant and Sabbath school teacher and, and vigilant eater. I've done all the stuff I was supposed to do. And this is the things I get. Where's your God now? And if God's all powerful, he could have stopped it. He could have at least let us know it was coming. He could have at least given us a little warning. And over and over again, I have sat at your feet on Sabbath morning and listened to you tell us that our God is a God of love. And I don't see any of that here. And I don't feel any of that here. And I'm confused and I'm hurt and I'm angry and I don't understand what's happening. And what I've learned over the years is that in those situations, probably the more I talk, the dumber I sound. There's probably what we call the ministry of presence. And the truth is, I don't know the answer to every question. And I don't always know what God is doing. Within the last week, I had a conversation with someone where I said, that millennial question, that's a, that's a question that we not, will not get answered until we get to the millennium. And I will tell you, when I get there, I've got a lot of questions. In fact, as soon as it is appropriate, I'm going to say, oh, whoa, 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 everybody stop. I want the angelic choir to shut up. 
I want all the crazy angels over here to zip it. God, front and center, me and you got to talk. You asked me to trust you, and I did, but I didn't understand. But I chose to trust you. I chose to walk by faith and not by sight. But I don't have to have faith anymore. Faith is believing in the unseen and, the, and believing in advance what only makes sense in reverse. And all. I don't have to do that anymore, God. God, I want answers, and I want to understand. And there's a lot of stuff that he and I want to talk about when we get up there to understand so I can have a full understanding of these things. And you know that the questions we're asking this morning, I'm kind of stirring up your pure minds this morning. I'm kind of pushing you a little bit, right? I'm kind of giving you some pushback and some challenge about this God of love that we believe in and that we preach about. But you understand these are not new questions, right? These questions did not arise when Bob kind of got a phone call in the middle of the night, Pastor, our daughter's been in a terrible accident. We don't know what's happening. Please come to the hospital. We didn't sit around the bedside saying goodbye to that young lady and say, oh, by the way, where's God? Good God, bad world. God of love, so much hurt and heartache. Oh, that's a problem. That's a tension for us intellectually. But these are questions that have been around for a very, very, very long time. These are questions that were around in Jesus' day. And I want you to look at a story with me this morning from the life of Jesus. This is a fantastic story. This is an incredible story. And to the casual reader, you will say it and say, oh, that's a nice story and it has a nice ending. That's not what we're going to do today. Today, we're going to take a deep dive in the text. We're going to take a deep dive in the scripture. And we're going to take the story and we're going to put it in its appropriate historical, cultural, social, and religious context so that we can actually understand what was taking place in the story. Because it is those that are willing to take a deep dive in the story that learn incredible things about God. And they unearth incredible treasures that Jesus was sharing with us here in this moment of his life. We're going to go to the book of John this morning. The book of John, <clears throat> we want to go to chapter 9. And as soon as I start to read this, you're going to go, oh, I know the story. All right? But I want you to listen with new ears. Because like I said, we're going to go deep today. John chapter 9, let's look at verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man there who was blind from birth. Now this is fascinating because in the book of John, Jesus heals six blind people. But this is the only one that he healed who was blind from birth. In fact, this is the only time that we know of that Jesus healed anyone who was blind from birth. Why is that significant? Look at verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, or this man, that he was born blind? You see it? There it is right there. They're doing it. They're doing it right there. God did it. God's responsible. God could have stopped it. God, who is all-powerful and who's all-loving, he's the one who did this. He's responsible for it. So help us understand, Jesus. There's the question that we've been asking. Good God, bad world. God of love in, in the midst of so much hurt and pain and heartache. God, who is all-powerful, then why doesn't he do, use some more of that power on my behalf to stop my hurt, heartache, pain, and sin? They're asking the question of Jesus right here. It's a fascinating little detail. God's responsible. God did it. God made it happen, God could have stopped it, and God didn't do it. Now, this is a universal human tendency for us as human beings. We all do this, and we all wrestle with this. But in this particular story, you kind of get the idea that there's a little bit more going on here, don't you? Right? They're not just asking this question casually, but you get tipped off that there is a broader discussion that has been taking place. There's a backstory, as they say. Because the disciples are actually inquiring about a debate that had raged on in Judaism literally for thousands of years. And it's a debate that we still debate today. Here's the context. In first century Judaism, there was a belief that, sin, that, that sickness came in response to sin. Just stop and think through the implications of that for a moment. Think through the theological implications and think through the social implications. If sickness comes in response to sin and you get sick, what does that say about you? 
Oh. I noticed on the screen this morning during our prayer time that someone was asking for prayer because they have pancreatitis. Do you know that if we lived in first century Judaism, you would not do that? You would never show up at church, show up at the synagogue on Sabbath morning and say, please pray for my mother. My mother has cancer. You would not do that. Because that says something about your mom. It says something about you. And it says something about your family. That has social implications and it has theological implications. Let's stop and think this through for a moment. This is fascinating to me because this sheds light on some things. This teaches us some things about the dialogue of Jesus and about the life of Jesus. Did you ever wonder why it is that the church leaders were so angry when Jesus healed people? I mean, in our day today, if we're in the middle of church and some guy rolls in here in a wheelchair and he parks right there, and in the middle of his sermon, Pastor Michael, the Holy Spirit just comes on him and he says, folks, just, let's just stop for a minute. We're going to pray. And he jumps off the platform and he walks down there and he lays his hands on his man and he prays. And he says, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And suddenly the guy jumps up out of his wheelchair. Are we angry at Pastor Michael? No. Do we think he's the greatest pastor in the world? Yes. Do you want him to pray for you? Yes, we would value this kind of, of action, wouldn't we? And yet in Jesus' day, the people got angry about it, and the religious leaders got angry. Why would they be angry? We just discovered why. Because if sickness comes in response to sin, then God is punishing people for their sin, and they got what they deserved. It was the just punishment for their sin. And now this man, Jesus, is messing with the judgments that God doles out, and you can't do that. That helps us understand a little bit about the relationship between Jesus and the church leaders of his day. This was the big reason why. This man is messing with the punishments that God has doled out. Now, if you live in a society believes this, that believes this and you're healthy, what does that say about you? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Right? I'm the man. I have standing. I have status. I have the adoration of my fellow worshipers. But if you are sick, what does that say about you? And think this through. What if you had been doing the very best that you knew how to do spiritually? What if you were the kind of person that tithed the mint and the cumin? And your conscience really was clear with regards to premeditated sin. And then a terrible disease came upon you. Wouldn't that be confusing? How would you reconcile that in your relationship, in your personal relationship with God? Furthermore, there was a belief that a man's disease could not be cured unless all his sin was forgiven him. So by he healing, Jesus was not only messing with God's punishments, he was also saying that he had the power to forgive sins, which makes him equal with God, which means he must be the Messiah, and they weren't willing to accept that. The church leaders of Jesus' place are in this place of cognitive dissonance because they cannot understand what they see taking place in front of them. Now, in first century Judaism, they had developed this theology so completely that they had decided that every sin had its particular punishment. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's interesting. So that means that you could tell what someone had done by the type of sickness they had. We're talking about some juicy, juicy gossip in Jesus' day. This sheds light on things. Remember the woman with the issue of blood when she sneaks in and she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment and then she's embarrassed when Jesus says, who touched me? Someone was sick. Because it, 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 it's like she now had to admit that she was sick and she'd had this disease and she'd had the disease for 12 years. Ooh, we know what you've been up to, right? This is part of the social fabric that we miss in 2021, the Western culture here in America, we miss all this. 
We have to place this story back in its original social, historical, religious, cultural context to really understand the dialogue and to understand what Jesus is getting ready to do to straighten out the distorted view of God that many people hold. Now, there are several examples of this in ancient, ancient documents like the Talmud and the Mishnah. They even tried to base this to some degree on scripture, right? I'm going to give you some really, really bad exegesis. This is what they believed in Jesus' day. As they would study the Old Testament, they would read the story of Samson, and the Bible says that Samson went after the desire of his eyes. At the end of his life, what got plucked out? His eyes, right? Remember the story of, of Absalom? What was Absalom proud of? His luscious locks of hair, right? At the end of the story... He got caught in the terebinth tree by his luscious locks of hair. Do you remember when he violated his father's concubines? Right? It was, it was a terrible thing that he did. He set a tent up on the palace so that the whole nation could see him leading the concubines into the tent one by one. And this was actually a, con a, a, a common practice in antiquity. It was a way of a, of a king coming in and saying, everything that you had is mine. Right? And so you would do this in a, in a very public setting. Right? Imagine doing that to his father. But do you remember how many of his concu father's concubines he violated? Do you remember? It was 10. And at the end of his life, when he's hanging in the terebinth tree by his luscious locks of hair that he was so proud of, Abner comes along and he pierces his heart with darts. Guess how many there were? 10. So the, the, now, the, what, now, folks, let me tell you. Let me be very clear. This is really, really bad exegesis. This is really bad theology. This is not what the Bible teaches. But in Jesus' day, they tried to base this belief of, well, if you get sick, it's because you sinned. And, and we can tell the kind of sin that you did by the kind of disease that you have, right? They would take these, they would try to root this in Scripture. That's not good biblical exegesis. It's not what the Bible teaches. But it is the common thinking of the day, and it helps us understand the context of the story that we're looking at here this morning in John chapter 9. Oh, this is fascinating. This is just fascinating. So Jesus comes along, and there's a man who's been blind since birth. And his disciples jump up, and the Lord, 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 the, the, the guy who's been blind since birth. Explain that to us. Now, now we know that disease comes in response to sin. That's their theology. That's their belief about God. You know what the word theology means? It means God words. That's all it is. They're God words. The words they believed about God, their concept of God was that he punished people in response to sin. But this case is confusing because he had been blind since birth. Now, what could a little baby have done that was so bad that God would strike him with blindness? That's confusing. They couldn't figure that out. So the rabbis of the day taught that something like that, it was probably his parents who did something bad, and so they got punished. Wow, what would that say about God? If God punishes your children with blindness because of something you did? And can you imagine being young parents that have your first baby, and then you realize he's blind? What does that say about you? And you probably have the husband looking at the wife saying, what did you do? And you have the wife looking at the husband saying, what did you do? Just, just think about the dynamics that that would bring to a family, that that would bring to a synagogue, that that would bring to a church. This is the context. And so the disciples come forward now, and they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Oh, now that I understand the context and the background, i got to tell you what, I am hooked into this story. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat because Jesus, I want to know the answer to the question too. Because Jesus' answer to this question is going to teach us fascinating things about God and his character. Here's the first thing I want to know is, are they right? Were they right in their God words? Were they right in their theology? Were they right that that's who God is and how God is? That's how God behaves and that's how God treats people? Does, does God do that? Does God punish people in that way? Does God punish babies in that way? This man was blind from birth. How could a baby do something so wrong? Fascinating question. Verse 3. Let's move on into the text. Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I am so happy that they were wrong about God. Is it okay for me to say that a lot of religious people are wrong about God? And by the way, when I say that to you, I'm not slapping around on you. I'm not, this is not a, let me smack around on my brothers and sisters. A lot of religious people are wrong about God. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, a jihadist. 
That's a religious view. That's a religious worldview. That's his theology that causes him to act that way and to treat people about that way. I would argue he's wrong about God. He's wrong about God. There's a, there's a lot of religious people who are wrong about God. And, and it causes me to ask myself the question, Bob, is, are there areas of your life where you're wrong about God? How would I know the answer to that question? Through a study of Scripture. Because Scripture is where I learn about God, and Scripture is God, where God reveals himself to me. Colossians chapter 2 says that in Christ, oh, I love this. This just gives me goosebumps when I think about this. In Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Stop and think that through. The Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, everything that they are, everything that, that represents them, their identity, their value systems, their heart, is compressed now and is packed tightly into the, the, the breast of a tiny human baby. His name is Jesus. And that's why it's so important for us to study the life of Jesus, because as we study his life, we begin to learn what God is like, and it is the clearest picture that we can have. It is God, the scripture is God's self-revelation. It is where he explains himself. He introduces himself. He exposes himself in this tremendously transparent way, and he says, let me introduce you, myself to you. I'm God, and here's my son Jesus. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And as we look at the life of Jesus, we begin to understand, God, this is fascinating. Oh, and back to John chapter 9. Jesus, now he, he's going to straighten out. Let me tell you what's fascinating. This is fascinating about this chapter of Scripture. You have a blind man who sees clearly. And the sighted people are all blind. That's what you learn by the end of the story. Even Jesus' own disciples, oh, these words of Jesus. Who sinned that man, this man or his parents? Neither, but that the works of God could be shown in him. Today, you are going to see the works of God. Today, by the time that we finish this message, you are going to understand God more clearly than the disciples of Jesus did in this very moment. They still didn't get it. Right up until the cross, they still didn't get it. Until post-cross, and, and really Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost and all the rest of it, is where they begin to understand God as well as you will today by the end of this message. Isn't that incredible? We're seeing a revelation of Jesus today. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Oh, I love this. So God doesn't do this thing of, if you don't obey me, you're really going to get it. He doesn't do that. You know why? Because I'm going I'm to use a word now, and as soon as I use this word, you're going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know the word, and you're going to turn it off. You're going to listen to it in, in sort of a, yeah, I know the word. I don't want you to do that. I want you to listen to this word as though you've never heard the word before, and I want you to really engage your mind and think about the word I'm going to use. Our God is merciful. To understand that word, turn the word around. What does it mean to be merciful? It means that he is full of mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. Our God is full of that. He is full of giving you what you don't deserve. You know, mercy and grace are a little different, right? There's some overlap between them, but they're a little different. Mercy is, getting what you, is, is not getting what you deserve. I think I said it wrong the first time. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Our God's full of that. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. And guess what? Our God is full of both of those. Our God is merciful, and our God is graceful. Can you imagine how it must have made Jesus' heart ache when they see this pitiful, pitiful case of a man who's been blind since birth, and in their God words, in their theology, they say, well, God's responsible for that. Can you imagine how the question must have rested on Jesus' heart? And he says, no, that's not who my father is. That is not, let me, the reason that happened is so that we could have this conversation because I got to straighten you people out. Because I'm going to give the revelation of my father in the way that I respond to this fascinating question. In response to our sin, God is patient. In response to our sin, God sends his Holy Spirit to convict us. 
His Holy Spirit's job is to activate the conscience, to lead us on a journey of sanctification. And in that journey, He shows us a little bit at a time where we need to grow, where we need to repent, where we need to receive cleansing from the God of the second chance, where we turn from habits and language and thoughts and actions that dishonor God. In response to our sin, God sanctifies us. He cleans our hearts out. He gives us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen to this. In response to our sin, God sent his son to redeem us. That is so incredible. Incredible. I have a son. I have a one and only son. I love him to death. We're very close. And I got to tell you, I like you folks. You're a nice group of people. But I would not give my son to save you. If it comes down to you and him, I'll just tell you right up front, you're, you're not going to fare well in that competition, right? He's my son. And yet God sends his son, his one and only son, his perfect son. He actually holds membership in the Trinity. God sends him to save us. He is, he is not the God that punishes our babies to get back at us because he's mad at us because we sinned. Look at verse 3 again. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. What that means is that all suffering is not a result of sin. That encourages my heart to realize that all suffering is not a result of sin. So every time something goes wrong in my life, I don't have to agonize over whether God is angry at me and over whether this is my punishment from God. God is not the angry prison warden whose mission is to catch me messing up so that he can punish me and so that he can enforce his prison rules. I had a dear friend in a church one time. She called me and said, my husband just cut off his finger. He was working on an addition for the house and he was holding a piece of wood and came across it with a skill saw and cut off his little finger. And so I went to the hospital and, you know, prayed with them and talked with them and he was out of surgery and all the rest of that. I went back and visited him a day or two later. And what he said to me, he said, Pastor, God just had to get my attention. And I said, no, that's not how it works. If you have a little spiritual drift factor in your life, Jesus doesn't come along and take a digit from you. I mean, if you have a real big screw up, then what's he going to do? Take your whole hand? I'm just curious, how much sin can I get away with before he takes my arm or my leg or both of my legs? This is not a God of love. I don't, I don't want to have that kind of negotiation with God when I wrestle with the sinful human nature. That, 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 that's not a God of love. That's a God of fear. That's not who our God is. Verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. When is the daytime? It's the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. The night is the time when his earthly ministry would be concluded. Just as a, a fun little side note here in the book of John, John uses this motif of light and darkness to teach us things about the spiritual world. And if you know about that, this is a fun study for you to do. Go do a study in the book of John and track down every time he talks about light and every time he talks about darkness and look at the spiritual applications that are taking place right there. I'm the light of the world. The, the light shined in the darkness, but the darkness did not accept it. It's really fascinating. And this is interesting. You get into John chapter 13, the upper room experience. Judas betrays Jesus. It's very fascinating what John slips into the end of the story. That, that Jesus says, what thou do, go and do thou quickly. It says Judas went out, and it was night. Isn't that fascinating? Because when Judas made the decision to betray Jesus, he stepped into spiritual darkness. The next time that we see Judas in the story... Judas is on his way up the hill of the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's leading the priests and the, the soldiers and the guards up there. And it's very interesting what they said. The, the text records that they were coming up the hill, and they had torches and lanterns. Because they're walking in spiritual darkness, now they have to create their own light. It's really very fascinating, right? When you see a sunrise or a sunset, remember that it is Jesus who is the light of the world, who shines his light upon this entire globe. I'm going to verse 6. <clears throat> when he had said these things, he spit on the ground, and he made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the man, the eyes of the man made blind with clay. Yuck. Can I just say that? Is that okay to say that that's yucky? 
Would you, uh, we, I'm not sure, is that sacrilegious to say Jesus did something yucky? It's kind of yucky. He spit in the dirt and he made mud and he, he wiped the blood on the man's eyes. And you wonder, why in the world did Jesus do that? Did Jesus have to do that to heal the guy? No. Jesus could have touched him and healed him. Jesus could have spoken and healed him. One time Jesus healed a guy from all the way across town. Remember the centurion sermon? He had a little girl from all the way across town one time. He says, go home. Your, your servant's well. Your daughter's well. Jesus didn't have to do that, but he chose to heal that way this time. We do not know why Jesus chose to heal in this way this time. What we do know is that in the first century, it was believed that saliva had healing properties. This was especially true when it came to medication for the eyes. So making an eye salve with saliva, though unheard of in our day, this would have been a common medical practice in Jesus' day. Perhaps Jesus knew that it would increase the blind man's faith. Perhaps it was because it was necessary for the blind man to have the exchange with the Pharisees that he would have later in the chapter. We won't be able to get to that part today. Perhaps Jesus just liked to play in the mud. Or perhaps, just perhaps, Jesus was using this as an opportunity to redefine the Sabbath for his disciples, for the Pharisees, and even for the blind man. Because it was against the law to heal on the Sabbath, particularly if the healing was not life-threatening. And it was against the law to administer medicine like an eye salve on the Sabbath, unless it was absolutely necessary. Was this case absolutely necessary? How long had he been blind? Since birth. Jesus could have waited till Sunday to administer his eye salve and to perform this healing. Albert Barnes comments on this passage by saying that he showed that their interpretation of the law of the Sabbath was contrary to the intention of God. And I wonder how often we still get this today, particularly with people that misunderstand the Sabbath. They don't understand it as the day of rest and refreshment. By the way, I really enjoyed Sabbath school. I appreciated your folks' engagement in Sabbath school. Many do not understand the Sabbath as a day of rest and refreshment and worship and fellowship. And some from the outside look at us and they say, well, well, they're being legalistic or they're being bound by the old covenant or they're trying to earn their way into heaven or some such misunderstanding. They somehow choose to interpret the Sabbath in the context of not understanding God's grace rather than that of understanding this as a response to God's grace. And by the way, this is another sermon. Let me just throw this in because this is fun. If you're not enjoying the Sabbath, I liked your comments about how this time just escapes you on the Sabbath. If you're not enjoying the Sabbath, you're not doing it right. If you groan when the Sabbath comes and you celebrate when the Sabbath is over, you're not doing it right. You're supposed to celebrate when the Sabbath comes and groan when the Sabbath is over. And I will tell you, in a moment of just transparency here, there are times when my life has gotten out of balance. I've gotten out of tune spiritually. And in my inner dialogue, it's a little bit like, oh, Sabbath's here. And I have learned that for me, that's an indicator that I need to pay attention to my spiritual life and I need a spiritual tune-up. And then there are other times when it's like, Sabbath is here! And that's an indicator of where I'm at spiritually and how it is that I'm disciplining my life in an appropriate way. And I'll just leave that for you. That's just for your own inner reflection. What a blessing that so many miss out on because they lose this true principle of Sabbath sacredness. Sabbath does not take anything away from you. Sabbath is not a subtraction thing. Sabbath is an addition thing. It brings blessing into your life rather than taking something away from you and out of your life. Back to our text, we're in verse seven. And Jesus said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and he washed. He came back seeing. And what I wouldn't have to have about two minutes of footage. I would, I would love it. You guys bending over. Where, where's the pool? Somebody take me to the pool. Oh, there's the water. And he washes it out. And he begins to see. And he runs back to the place where Jesus was because he wants to find this man. Would he know him by seeing him? No. He would know him by hearing him and he's running back but he's looking at all of these new sites and he's looking at color and he's looking at people and he's figuring out the whole spatial awareness thing as he's walking right 
and he's listening intently for the voice of this man whose eyes he wants to look into. And can't you just hear God saying, that is who my heavenly father is. What is with this nonsense that comes out of your mouth? Who is it that sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. You do not know my father. You do not know his character and his heart. And you do not understand my mission to come and to save and seek that which was lost. I am the physician that comes to save those who are sick, not to celebrate with those who think mistakenly that they are well. And that is who my heavenly father is. He comes back seeing. That is what my father's heart is like. That is what his character is like. That is his intent toward humanity. It is to seek and to save and to restore and to encourage. And I can just hear Jesus was just kind of this mm, slam dunk moment. That's who my father is. That's what he's like. And that's why I've come into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. In this story, it's not just about a man who was born blind. This story is not just about his healing. It's about the healing of everyone that was there. And it's about the healing of everyone that reads the story today, you and me included. That's what this story was about. It started with a blind man, but it was also intended for the disciples, the church leaders, the onlookers, and finally those of us who would read this story. Jesus heals the blind man, but also everyone who would accept his healing I have. And I just wonder if you need any of that today. I wonder if, if, if today you might still have some of the remaining vestiges in your heart of thinking that God is an angry God, that he's just anxious to catch you messing up and sinning, that he loves to dole out punishment kind of like the angry prison warden because that is a ploy of the devil, and I would give the devil high, high, high marks in his success on that campaign and of distorting our view of what our Heavenly Father is like. But Jesus came to straighten out that view and to give us all the ISAV because it is terrible when you have sighted people who are blind and who cannot see. We don't need to be that kind of people today. Dr. C.I. Schofield once attended a Bible conference in New York City, and the chairman called upon another minister to pray, and his prayer went something like this. Oh, thou great and terrible God, great is thy majesty, and a great distance separates us from thee, poor lost sinners that we are. Have mercy on our souls. And at the conclusion of the prayer, Dr. Schofield leaned over to another minister and he said, why doesn't somebody give that man a New Testament? And how about you today? Do you have a New Testament? Do you read it? And do you find there the God that Jesus came to introduce us to? Do you understand his intent toward you? Do you understand his character? That he longs to be in fellowship and relationship with you and to redeem you? because that is who our God is. Neither this man nor his parents sinned that he was born blind, but that the works of God may be shown in him for his benefit and for yours and for mine. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this story. What an incredible, incredible story. What an amazing chapter of scripture that reaches out to us today that challenges us today, that, that heals our own blindness, that pulls the scales and the cataracts from our eyes, and that says, this is who my Heavenly Father is, and this is what He is like. God, I believe that I speak accurately on behalf of this congregation when I say that today we want your healing eye salve, and we want to receive you, we want to know you and experience you in the same purity and with the same hearts full of love is that once blind man who came running back from the pool and says, where is this man, Jesus? Where is this man who has opened my eyes both physically and spiritually? God, we want to enter into that experience today. And we pray this prayer in the name of our Jesus. Amen.